So before getting started on this, I'm not officially starting my seven minutes uh, until I, I, I give a bit of an overview. Uh, so the, what we're trying to do with this is basically you know, talk about the sustainable development goals. Um, there's people from across campus who, who tend to look at similar problems but from much different lenses. And so we wanted to have a bit of a conversation about that. Uh, and so we're going to start off right now by talking about goal number three, which is good health and well-being. Um, so I'm going to first speak about it, and then uh, Greg is going to speak about it from uh, what will be a, a different view. Also, side note, can you tell it's the end of the week and my feet hurt from teaching all week, so that's why I'm sitting. Um, <laughs> I need better shoes. So anyways, uh, you know, when we tend to think about something like good health and well-being, that's the sustainable development goal number uh, three, we tend to think about, you know, things like medicine, uh, vaccines, hospitals, and this kind of question comes up of, well, why am I here? I'm from Ivy, um, where I do research related to business. And so the reason why we're going to get into some of that, and a lot of it has to do with, well, this question of bridging the social and the technical gap. Um, Traditionally, in a lot of development work, we've tended to look at technical solutions of, let's say, things like creating vaccines or nutrition programs, trying to get proper feeding guidelines out to new mothers, uh, and things like that. And we've, we've done a pretty good job of that, um, but where, in my opinion, there's been a lot of, uh, a rather big shortcoming is in actually getting that out to people. And so, uh, when I say the technical side, I mean, let's say on campus, information coming from the STEM fields. Um, whereas I, I think development work hasn't necessarily drawn on social sciences an awful lot, and that's why we have a lot of these technical solutions that don't end up actually getting used where they're supposed to be used, or by people who, uh, who are supposed to use them. Um, and I'll talk more about that with respect to, to one example. So. I have a project in the north of Ghana right now where uh, it's, it's a collaboration with uh, CARE, the, the international NGO, so their, their country office. Um, and in the north of Ghana, in the northern region, there's rather high levels of malnutrition uh, amongst children. And so some of that just has to do with uh, food scarcity during um, sort of that hunger season before crops come back around. But another part of that is wound up in children not getting the proper food, uh, as well as not, especially when it comes to proper micronutrient profiles. And so CARE as an organization uh, worked to develop with the Jinomoto, uh, the Japanese food conglomerate, a, uh, a technical solution, Coco Plus. So it's a nutritional supplement. It's added to the weaning food, the local weaning food that... Uh, uh, children in that area use, so after six months. Um, that is called cocoa, hence the cocoa plus. Uh, it's basically a peanut and a soy uh, base with a whole bunch of micronutrients thrown on top. And that, you know, from a technical standpoint, works pretty well. Um, they also, in the first phase of the program, put together a whole bunch of nutrition education and just getting that proper information out to people. Um, and again, these are all things which in theory should work quite well. Uh, but in practice, things tended to fall apart. So in the first phase of the project, there was actually one field officer from uh, each, from care in each of the communities. Uh, and so that field officer was there basically five or six days out of seven, was making sure things were going smoothly. And so while that person was there, um, you know, there was pretty good uptake of the nutritional product, which costs about seven cents per day to use. Uh, there was also pre people, there was a lot of education going on in those communities. They had community volunteers doing a lot of that. Um, but as soon as CARE left, things fell apart. And that's, uh, that's a rather common challenge. Um, and so that's, that's where I came into this is for the second phase, the rollout, they're going to have one field officer in each for every 15 communities, so instead of one to one, it's one to 15. Um, and they were also then started becoming really concerned about, well, what happens after we're done here? Is this all just gonna fall apart? Uh, and so that to me becomes sort of the organizational challenge of this, of how do we map these technical solutions onto an actual specific uh, context so that things will actually work. Um, and so the context we're, in which we're working, is they're pretty rural locations, things are pretty isolated, and you also have uh, rather strong local institutions. So things like uh, chieftaincies within the communities are tend to be rather important. Um, so what we ended up doing is we worked with CARE, uh, both to modify some of their internal organization, but also to you know work on embedding the project within the community. Because previously, everybody involved sort of saw this as CARE's project, and that, that project's outside of the 
CARE's outside of the community and, and certainly isn't a member of the community. So as soon as CARE goes away, they stop getting that push, that motivation to do things. So it really becomes a challenge of how do we make this, work this into sort of the, the fabric of those communities. Um, there was a couple ways we thought of doing that, so we're actually testing two of them against each other uh, with CARE right now. So I think we're in like month eight of data collection. Um, it's going fairly well, so we'll, we'll see how that ends up. But you know, the last point to touch on is, is in some ways it seems trivial to say we have to, to organize these solutions uh, for a particular context, but for an organization like CARE who's not used to doing that, um, because again, they come from, uh, uh, you know, they're used to seeing this as we have a technical solution, let's get it there, and then of course things will work out. That means that your staff has to start thinking about things rather differently, um, and you just have to generally have a different organizational structure. And so, uh, to me, this becomes really important if we're going to deal with this sustainable development goal, because in my mind, there's a lot of value that can be created, not that a lot of value that can be created by using existing technical solutions. It, it isn't necessarily up to making new ones. There certainly is space for new ones, but I think there's a lot of value that can come uh, from just using the ones we have and getting them actually used where they're needed. So, with that, I'm done. Thank you. Uh, so, I like this uh, story because it's about a person, hypothetical person. Why does this person called Kananga not, not leave the house? <laughs> He's too weak in his rushes on his body. So, um, if you think of the development goals in health, then this would suggest there's some health issues. But this first thing is, has nothing to do with health, really. Um, why is he weak in his rushes? Because uh, he's HIV positive, he's taking antiretroviral. So, that means that there's uh, disease, there's side effects, and there's access to therapy. Um, why does the therapy not help him get stronger so it's not working that well? Um, he doesn't have willpower, so that's, a, that's really not HIV, that's a mental illness issue. There's no appetite, uh, and he gets constant diarrhea. Why is he no appetite? Well, his neighbor is run down, he worries about not providing for his family, he's no food or, medi or medicine to give him hope. Well, why does he live in that neighborhood? So that's nothing to do with the disease itself, but it's very integral to his problem. Um, well, because he's born there, and that's where his parents live, so then he wants to be around family support. So what is it that, that my family is in Scotland? It's about as far away as you can have family. So what does it take for someone to leave their home? Is it, is it an opportunity that they were given? Is it just a desire? Is it someone gave them the airfare? There's uh, many reasons, in his case, he maybe doesn't know about outside. I was in Indianapolis in 1976, and I was, I was illegally working in a, a kitchen. It was a dinner theater, and these black kids had never been outside Indianapolis. So their idea of the world was like, so they said, you from Scotland? Where's Scotland? Not near New York. Because uh, they figured New York, they had of New York, so they figured everywhere must be near New York. And we had to explain there was an ocean, and you know, it, it just was uh, foreign to them. You can't get clean water and nutritious food. Well, why? Um, because many people can. Uh, he's no money, he's no strength to walk and fill the jug. Can his wife fill the jug? Yeah, but what's his wife here? His wife's looking after the kids. His wife's out selling patties. She's doing everything possible to do uh, to keep the house going. And why can she not make food that's more nutritious? Well, nobody gave her the opportunity. So um, you have to kind of look at life. And uh, it's ironic. One of the things I was going to ask, not really a question, but the point I was going to make to you, when I started at Glasgow University, I'm pretty sure I can't really remember totally, but I think we had a faculty of arts and science. I never did any art. I was terrible at art, per se. But there's a lot of things that the art community, social science community, can bring. And it's ironic that um, we, as the medical researchers, come up with the solution. But it's the social scientists and, and other people who put it into action. So if you don't have the two, how is it going to work? And we don't make our students learn social science or arts in any shape or form. In fact, visual arts is probably the best for lateral thinking. And there's inequality issues and poverty and malnutrition and poor education. That's nothing to do with disease. 
So if you're trying to introduce something that affects this, you have to look at uh, all these parameters. And um, we could have studied in, in North America, and, and here's one of my circles. So this is um, the Great Lakes, and we sort of think the Great Lakes are, are good, but in fact they're contaminated by mercury and PCBs and all other things. So this isn't just about a, an issue with Africa. Um, the African place that we study is also a circle, and it's Lake Victoria, and it's dying. 50, 40 million people live in that lake, and it's dying. It may even be dead. Um, what is the implications for the people there is uh, really spectacular and has a massive influence on health, and yet the issue is we're killing a lake, which really isn't a health issue per se, but the repercussions of it are. So this is probiotics. Um, if you're going to study probiotics, then you need to look at strains that have been well studied. This one's 809 publications, 154. So we're, 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 looking, we're not experimenting in Africa. And if you're going to do it, you should consider why. So the probiotic strains are active against food pathogens. So diarrhea and food infections are a massive cause of illness in Africa. Has to be safe in HIV patients because there's lots of them. Has to modulate immunity. So if you're going to pick them, then you have to look at does it help children? Does it help people in that community? And it does. So our project has uh, so far over two million portions of probiotic yogurt have been made. Which is, um, kind of hard to imagine in 2004 that Western heads East would have led to over two million units of yogurt. There's now 200 to over, there's 220 units now. This is um, over 100 in Uganda. Uh, the ones in Kenya have fallen down, but they're going to come back in a big way. Uh, 1,576 women that we can count. That's a lot of women in power. Um, it's gender equal. So I'm a scientist. What did I care about gender equal? But you have to do that, right? So that's again outside of normal health sciences. About 250 consumers are people with access to it, which is pretty amazing. And here's my semicircle, it's not maybe so obvious, but this is the value chain. Now, um, I, again, I wouldn't have cared about value chain except I did have an MBA, but, uh, and I was interested in it, but your average scientist doesn't care about a value chain. But in fact, it's integral to this. So you have your cows, you have milk, you have ingredients, production, and there's people at every stage in this, right through to the people who get it, and then the, this. So the value chain is 10 times the value of the bottom of the pyramid, so it increases um, the opportunity for impacting health. So that's it, seven minutes. Yeah, like 25 seconds to spare. <laughs> well done. Well done. It's a good problem. Yeah, thank you. That was great.